Hey guys, it's Sam from The Learning Studio here, and I'm going to discuss possibly the most confusing topic in linear algebra, which is eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So most students I come across have no idea why these things are important, they have no way to conceptualize it, uh, no idea of what's actually happening in the background, right? Usually the way it's taught is, okay, here's a matrix, um, this matrix has eigenvalues. Okay, so you can find some special eigenvalues, um, you can find some eigenvectors that are associated to those. Okay, great. What does that actually mean? Why do we care about this? Okay, why, are these, why do these numbers matter? And the main reason that I think this is so confusing uh, is because matrices are sort of not the right thing to be thinking about here. And if you really think about it, from the very start, matrices were very, very confusing, right? You had some, some array of numbers, um, and prob someone probably taught you how to multiply matrices. And multiplying matrices is a very weird thing, right? You, you somehow start here, and this hand moves this way, and this hand moves this way, and you multiply things and add them together, okay? and somehow you get a three here, and then you move on and multiply these things together, and you get a four here, okay? and you end up with all these numbers, all right? And it just seems like a sort of a completely random process, right? Someone had these two arrays of numbers and they decided, okay, this is, this is what it means to multiply them. And again, the reason that this is so confusing a process, it seems like there's, there's no reason behind it. The reason is because these matrices are not the real objects that we're studying. Matrices are just a shadow of the actual objects that we want to look at. And the actual objects we're looking at are linear maps. So what the hell is a linear map? Well, a linear map is a map between vector spaces. Okay. So here I have two vector spaces, right? This is R2 and another copy of R2. All right, so I'm thinking of vectors in here. Okay, I have arrows, they're my vectors, and I'm mapping vectors from here to vectors over here, right? Maybe this vector maps to some other vector over here. Okay, but I have to do it in a way that preserves the structure of a vector space. Okay, so the important thing about a vector space is that you can add vectors and you can multiply them by a scalar. You can stretch them, right? And so I want my maps to play nicely with the scalar, scalar multiplication and addition that's over here. Okay, so I don't want to completely ruin my vector space structure when I, when I map across. Okay, and that's what a linear map will do. And so the way to put that formally is to say that, okay, I want my map to preserve this structure, right? So if I have scalar multiplication and addition of my vectors over here, okay, I want that to be preserved when I map. Okay, so this is saying that it sort of doesn't matter if I do my addition and multiplication over here and then map, or if I map the vectors first and do the addition and multiplication over here, I want to get the same result. Okay, this is the definition of a linear map. That's what it means for my t to be linear. And this is a really common theme in mathematics, right? So we've taken some object, which is the vector space. Okay, we have vector spaces, we have a definition for what they are, and then we're interested in the maps between them that preserve that structure. Okay, and you'll find in high level math that that's almost every course you study is that. They introduce an object and then they talk about maps between those objects. Okay, if you have groups, you talk about homomorphisms. Okay, they're the maps that preserve your group structure. Okay, if you have differentiable manifolds, you talk about diffeomorphisms. They preserve the differential structure. Right? So that's always what we're interested in, an object and the maps between them. Okay, so how do matrices come into this story here? Well, the way they're going to arise is that we're going to have to pick a basis for our vector space. Okay, so let's look at a specific example. We're going to pick, choose a simple map, right? So our map is going to be reflection across this line, um, which is the line, I guess, y equals x. All right, so we're going to take a vector here, reflect it across, and that will give us our vector over here. Okay, so that's our map. There's no, no matrices yet. There's no basis. I've just defined my map as reflection in this line. Hey, if you give me a vector, I can give you another vector over here that's been reflected in that line. So for me to get a matrix here, I need to choose a basis. Okay? 
and the matrix I get is going to depend on the basis that I choose. So normally the basis that we pick, okay, our standard basis is I and J. Okay, and because this map preserves linearity, um, all I need to do is define what happens to I and J, and I've defined my map. Okay, and that's not special for I and J. If I choose any basis, once I define T on the basis, that will define the whole map, right? Because every vector is a combination of my basis vectors. So let's look at what happens here. In this case, it's fairly easy to see what happens to I and J. Right? If I reflect I in this line, it's going to flip up and give me J. Right? So I've got I mapping to J. Okay? And J is going to flip down and map to I. Okay? And so I can write that as a matrix. Okay? So this column is what happens to I. So I maps to J, which in this basis is 0, 1. And J maps to I, which in this basis is 1, 0. Okay? So that's where I is mapped to. And this is where J has mapped to. Okay, and now I have a matrix. Okay, and sometimes we'll write that T is this matrix. Um, some people even emphasize the basis that they're, they're using. Right, because the matrix depends on the basis you choose. So to illustrate this a little further, if I chose a different basis, okay, I'm going to choose this as my basis. Okay, these two vectors form a basis for R2 as well. And so I can define my map in terms of this basis. Okay, and if I do that, the matrix that I'm going to get is this matrix. Okay, and this is the matrix we get for this basis. So don't worry about how I work this out. This obviously took some calculation, right? But the point is that if you choose different bases, you get different matrices for this map. But it's still the same map. I just get different matrices. Okay, and you can also see that some bases give me simpler matrices than others. Okay, and so one question you might ask is, okay, is there a way to make this matrix sort of as nice as possible? Okay, in fact, the best possible one in our case would be a diagonal matrix because they're easy to multiply. So in this setting, it's also obvious why matrix multiplication is the way it is. So matrix multiplication actually comes from composing these linear maps, right? So if I have a map here, and then I map this to another vector space, okay, it doesn't even have to be the same dimension. I could map it to a three-dimensional space, a four-dimensional space, whatever. Okay? I have some other map. When I compose them, what's going to happen to the matrices is that they multiply. Okay? And so the reason multiplication of matrices is the way it is, is because that's what happens when you compose linear maps. Okay? So when you look at it in this framework, it makes perfect sense, right? It's not some arbitrary random method of, of multiplying these arrays together. Okay? There's an actual basis for why we're doing this. So another question that we could ask in this setting is, okay, are there any subspaces of this vector space that are fixed by our map, okay, that don't change, right? So we're looking for some invariant things about our map, okay? And that question is exactly what are the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of our map. So in this example, it's fairly easy to see um, some invariant subspaces, okay? We're reflecting in this line, right? So any vector that lies on the line is not going to change at all, right? If I pick i plus j and reflect it in that line, Okay, it's not going to move, right? Nothing happens to that. Okay, another vector that's easy to see what happens to is this vector okay, that's perpendicular to our line of reflection. Obviously, when we reflect this vector in our line, it completely shifts. It gets completely reflected, right? It's the opposite of what it was. Okay, and so those two vectors, okay, in fact, those two lines, those subspaces, are preserved by our map. And so if we really want to work with this linear map and do lots of calculations with it, it makes much more sense for these two vectors to be our basis. Okay. We're going to see that if we choose these to be our basis, 
the matrix that we get in that basis is a diagonal matrix. Okay, it's the, the simplest sort of matrix you can work with. Okay, so how do we go about finding these invariant subspaces? Okay, well, if we write down what it actually means for a one-dimensional subspace to be invariant, okay, it means that if I take some vector and apply my map, I should end up with that same vector or maybe some scaled version of it, right? Because that's a one-dimensional subspace, is just a line. So I get my vector, or it lies on, on the line, okay? Containing that vector. And this is the equation that you usually see in your linear algebra course, right? Someone slaps that up on the board and says, all right, we're trying to find vectors that satisfy this equation. Okay, and in that context, it's just like, why? Why do we care about it? But when you look at it in this framework, it's sort of a perfectly reasonable question to ask yourself, okay? And, and that's what drops out afterwards. Okay, and so then obviously you can rearrange it. Okay, could be one T minus lambda I times our vector to give us a zero vector. All right, and for this to work for non-zero V, um, it means that this matrix is not invertible. Okay, it has determinant zero. And that's where we get the equation to find our eigenvalues. Okay, so if we want to find eigenvalues, we normally solve this equation. Okay, we want the determinant to be zero. So in the example we have here, um, this matrix we get is just going to put a minus lambda in the diagonals. Okay, and so we want the determinant of that to be zero. And the determinant of this is lambda squared minus one. Which tells us that our eigenvalues are plus or minus one. Now it turns out that each unique eigenvalue will give you a unique fixed subspace. Okay? So I should have two fixed subspaces, right? Because I have two distinct eigenvalues. And I can just work out these subspaces by using this equation. Okay, so if I pick lambda equals one, I'm looking for vectors that satisfy this. Okay, if lambda equals one, I just get the same thing back. Okay, and so when I solve this, hey, the both lines are telling me that A should equal B. All right, and so my eigenvectors are vectors of this form. And okay, so one, one is an eigenvector, and actually any vector along this line is an eigenvector, right? And we, we sort of already knew that from the geometry here. So for the other eigenvalue, I do the same thing. In this case, both equations tell me that A equals minus B, and so our vectors are of this form. Okay, and this is our second eigenvector. Okay, and that corresponds to this subspace where the vectors get completely reflected across the line. Okay, so they're the two subspaces which we already sort of knew were going to be fixed, but now we have a method for doing this um, regardless of the linear map, regardless of whether we can actually see it easily or not. All right, so finally, if I pick a basis consisting of eigenvectors, okay, so if I choose these to be my basis vectors, then the matrix that I end up for, with for T is the diagonal matrix, which is going to have the eigenvalues on the diagonal. Okay, and this is a much simpler matrix to work with, if you're going to be using it a lot. So I hope this kind of clears up some of the confusion you might have had with these, these concepts. Uh, let me know if there's anything else you'd like me to talk about in the comments.